had taken some time off. Oh, okay. We're recording now. Okay, sorry. So um, I, um, my background is um, I actually uh, worked for several years at the Martin Arboretum. And so I tend to have more of a horticulture kind of background and a um, ecology background. Um, that's where my interests and hobbies lie, but I've picked up a lot of other science over the years and I've been teaching for a long time. So um, I presently teach physics and AP biology. And um, last year I was doing uh, all of the freshman biology, but we've kind of changed our curriculum. And so now I'm doing earth science. So that's kind of been an expansion of my, uh, my learning gig, but um, yeah. Do you want to hold up? I, I just want to do an introduction first. Oh, okay. I'm and sorry. And then we can start. I'm sorry. Um, and I think we have enough here. And I just want to welcome um, everyone to our April Time at Revisited Forum. I am Michael Bowles of the Association for the Wolf Lake Initiative. I am co-host with Dr. Valerie Penanen of Calumet College of St. Joseph. Um, and I, um, and Calumet Revisited is funded in part by the Indiana Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, before we hear from tonight's speaker, are there any announcements? If not, I just have the one, uh, the kind of nature exchange about which we'll be speaking tonight um, is uh, facilitated by Ollie. And it Sorry. is via Zoom at 7 p.m. Tuesday, April 19. Uh, licensed teachers in Illinois, Indiana can earn one hour of professional development credit for attending. Uh, the presentation this evening is being recorded. I think it's announced itself a little while ago. Uh, the, the recording will be available within a week on Ollie's website. Would uh, everyone please remain on mute? After the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. She didn't um, throw anything at us. No, 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 no. She didn't throw no, anything no, at no, us. Someone, no, someone needs to mute. Michael, you have the ability to mute other people. So yeah, I, she was, she was yes, I got it. No, she was showing I don't know. you. I don't know if I had a call up and tell them that I had the blood test today, because I don't know if I was supposed to wait a while. Okay. If it's how many months ahead, I couldn't All get through right, okay. I had to get her phone number. I left a message on the phone. All right, okay. Because I don't know if this... If, if, it, if it was okay, right. because they're going to say there's some kind of change or something, okay. I don't know. All right. Michael, can you mute, mute them? Yeah, I'm trying to mute them. Organize it. What? You just click on their box. You should be able to do it. I know. I can't. Okay. <sighs> Okay, I, I think that should fix it. Um, um, I, don't, I don't think it did. It doesn't look like it is. Yeah, and you turned my video off. <laughs> I I, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I can't, I can't, uh, I can't override you. Okay. Um, I'm trying to. I can't find the, per the person that's unmuted. I don't know. I think it's it's Ms. Mulak. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought. Um, Okay. So if I you think... click on the, the, the image, it says participants, and you should okay. see them on the side. And I think you should have the ability to mute them. Yeah, I think I have everybody muted. Okay. Um, all right. So let's, let's just carry on. Um, 
but you uh, still I need mentioned. to turn my video on. I can't do it. You have to turn my video on. You blocked me. What was the so question? At the bottom of your screen, it'll say participants. If you click on that button where it says, like shows the little picture of people. Right. And it opens up a box on the side of Zoom. Yes. And you can see there where my name is, where Jane Healy's name is, and you see how you've blocked the camera. There's like a little camera icon. I need you to click on that that red blocked out camera icon so okay. that I can use my video again. Okay. For some reason I can't get. It doesn't allow me to change yet. Um, okay, well, can you, I don't know if you're gonna be able to hand over the, um, the, sh the share screen, like I can request a share screen, but if you want me to run the presentation, I have to be, I think you have to see my camera, but I'm making, okay, are you able to see my share screen right now? Yeah. Okay, cool, all right. So then we'll just go right in here. I'll just at least get that loaded up. Um, okay. All right, so you, you can't well, see me, my video, me, but finish the introduction. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, as I said, after the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. Tonight, we will learn about the climate nature change and what this group is doing to reconnect youth with nature. The idea for the exchange occurred uh, during the final session of the Wolf Lake Watershed Advisory Committee meeting on in November of 2022. Three science teacher fellowship winners discussed their projects. And during a lively question and answer session that followed, discussion led to the challenge of uh, teaching nature to students in a virtual setting. The idea of forming a group to discuss this and other issues followed. Ali agreed to facilitate such a venture, but teachers and youth group leaders must run it. Following that script, I now turn this over to Jane Healy. Um, and following uh, the, the presentation, with, which would also include Wayne Schemp, um, um, we will have a question and answer session of our own. Okay. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Thank I can you. hear you. Yeah. Um, and can you see the screen that the blue screen that says reconnecting youth to nature? Oh, uh, it just says loading. Oh, okay. It says screen sharing is paused. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share here. I'm going to see if I can reload it here. Um, and we'll go back to this. All right. So, of course, now it, it won't. I have to reload it because I've logged out. Okay. So, can you see a, a screen that says reconnecting to youth to yep. nature? Yes. Now, we yes. Now we can. Okay. All right. Good. That's excellent. Good. I'm glad it's still going. All right. So, um, all right. So, I was just saying, like, my background, I kind of have sort of a horticulture background. Um, I got a, a science degree before I went back to school to get the teaching degree and had was actually working on a master's in uh, liberal arts and sciences from uh, Grinnell. Um, but then I moved back to Illinois, which is where I grew up. I grew up in this area. And uh, started teaching. I had taught at Mother Macaulay for several years. I taught down at Bremen High School for several years, and then I kind of stepped out of the rat race and did uh, the mommy thing for for a little bit longer than I was intending. Um, and so I've been teaching now for <laughs> since 1986. So I've been around for a long time. But um, all right. So um, I really feel I feel it's imperative that kids spend time in nature. And so it was kind of a great topic for me to talk about. Um, I feel that spending time in green spaces is really important and teaching kids about ecology. And so um, all of this teaching that I do uses it through the lens of ecology, just because I feel so strongly um, that we need to protect our planet and we need to empower kids to do that. Um, one of the things I have seen that has been developing in the last probably 10 years, but really particularly in the last five years is kids are getting extremely uh, depressed thinking about the future. Um, I mean, like legit, like angry and sad and depressed. Um, and it's really disturbing. I mean, I'm glad that they're feeling empowered that, you know, like, you know, that 
climate change is real, but um, I don't want to feel, I want kids to feel defeated by that. And so um, getting kids out into nature and making them feel that they can be responsible for making change and that they can make a difference, I think is really, really important and powerful. Um, so, okay, without further ado, hopefully I can get this working here. Um, this is our nearby Wolf Lake. Um, not, excuse me, this is not Wolf Lake, this is Big Marsh. Um, and uh, if you know much about this park, uh, this was basically where the slag was dumped from US Steel. Um, and you can see that um, it's being turned into a quality wetland. Um, now, it, it's not a primary wetland, right? It's kind of a reestablished wetland, but it's amazing how nature hangs on. And uh, taking kids to places like this can be incredibly powerful. Um, I, Lisa runs um, scouting troops and helps out with Cub Scouts and I do a lot of stuff with my kids. I bring them to field trips here and um, it's, it's amazing what a difference it, it makes for kids to spend a day in nature. So the question you have to ask yourself is like, why is time spent in nature important for kids? And there's a whole lot of data that talks about how important spending time in green space is. Um, some recent studies that have come out um, show that people who spend two hours a week or more in green spaces uh, hey, have much better self-reporting, but self-report much better um, positive health developments, um, feel psychologically much better. And uh, the other thing about uh, some of the studies is that the two hours was really a hard boundary. It didn't matter if you did 20 minutes every morning or if you did, you know, um, an hour twice a week or you went out for a hike for one, you know, morning in a week or one evening. Um, two hours was that hard bargain and, and the benefits were really substantial after that. And it didn't matter what your demographic level was. It didn't matter what your age. It didn't matter your income. It didn't matter your background. It didn't matter what part of the world you came from, whether you came from South Africa, whether you came from Morocco, whether you came from Taiwan, whether you came from France, whether you came from <sighs> Canada. Um, this was really, clearly it's very important for the human psyche to spend time in nature. And so, you know, I threw a couple of pictures from just some walks that I've taken, you know, in the last couple of months, because I think it, it's really indicative. It just, you know, it's a sense of peace, right? It's calmness, it's beauty. Um, this was in Paddock Woods over in Palace Park. These pictures were taken in the last few years. So um, multiple studies point that out that, you know, nature is really important for physical health and for positive cognitive function. And again, age, demographics, doesn't matter. So there was a, a book that was published several years ago that was, I think, a real awakening call for a lot of people. And that was Last Child in the Woods. Um, and uh, it was talking about, his, his premise was, is that kids are experiencing this nature deficit disorder. And I myself saw that um, really powerfully. Um, at the time, my kids were fairly young, and I saw kids whose parents would not let them out of the house. They were not allowed to play outdoors because their, their parents were worried about their safety. Um, and I took it as a personal mission to help change that because I just thought that that was just yeah. horrific. The kids were not allowed to play on the street. They couldn't go to the park. They weren't allowed to walk and play around in ditches. And I remember spending a whole lot of time when I was a kid. Uh, just literally wandering in the woods and the forest preserves, you know, taking a stick and playing in the mud, um, poking under things, moving rocks and finding out what was underneath that. Um, and so I started up a bike club and I would take kids out from the neighborhood through my park district. They allowed me to do this and um, we would go for bike rides. And I made it a hard point that we would go and find whenever possible, I would take them to a green space and just cut them loose for about 45 minutes and let them run around and explore. Um, and I felt like it was really important that kids had sort of an unstructured, un, like supervised, but not... Um, not sort of um, adult directed experience with nature. Um, and part of it was like really not from reading this book. It was just because of my own concerns about kids not really having a time or even knowing how to self play. So studies really back up this idea that we need to spend time in nature. Um, there are literally hundreds of studies that tell us that kids who spend time in nature and learn in nature do better. They do better with attendance. They do better with behavior in school. They do better on standardized tests. 
Um, and they have typically stronger and better reading and writing skills compared to their peers who do not have similar experiences. Even when you take into account things like uh, urban, suburban, uh, rural, when you take into account things like socioeconomic backgrounds, when you talk about race, all of those things were not really the issue. Um, so we can say from some of this evidence that nature um, really seems to affect how students can both attend to and engage in the classroom and how well they concentrate and also how well they get along with teachers and with their peers. Um, and the data really, like I said, really supports that. There was a lot of, um, when I was kind of doing a deep dive into this, I was finding study after study after study after study that was supporting these ideas. All right, so what are some of the benefits? Well, you know, you can see kids hanging out here, right? This was, again, this was taken at Big Marsh. Um, these were kids who were sort of exploring some of my students. Um, we know that nature restores children's attention, okay? We know that spending time in nature, whether it's just hanging out in your backyard, whether it's looking out a window at nature, whether it's taking a walk in a park, playing in a playground with trees, all of these we know have serious benefits to kids on how well they concentrate and how well they even perform on cognitive tests. Um, so distractions at school or at home, this can help kids to overcome it. Mental fatigue, because kids are just kind of burned out from everything they're doing in the day. Uh, kids with ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactive disorder and also attention deficit disorder, which is sort of um, inattentive form. It's not like squirrely kids, but it's kids who just are like spacing out. Um, there's a chronic lack of sleep in kids and spending time in nature really helps with that. And even noise, um, being exposed to loud noises and a lot of street light and stuff at night is interfering with kids' sleep patterns and their ability to focus. Spending time in nature helps to counteract that. Um, again, study after study shows that there's benefits. There's cognitive benefits and there's concentration benefits for kids who are given the chance to spend time in nature. So this is one of the Cub Scout packs. Lisa, can you speak to these little guys? Because they're super cute. Yes, I sure can. So um, during COVID, we found that getting outside was the way that we handled COVID. Um, excellent. I mean, like it just all worked. Um, we were able to social distance. We were able to, you know, still they were able to see each other and do activities. And um, so we used that, those times out to, to um, get them outside. This was a hike out at Miriam Burns Preserve, what we thought, you know, in the beginning times of, this is, I believe, August of 21. Um, what we found during the beginning of COVID times, like we were very careful, you know, I, I had the thought that not under my watch was anyone getting sick. So what we would do would be go out by family kind of and um, hike and um, Miriam Burns was a local place, is a very local um, neighborhood um, under a Chicago Park District. Um, they have, um, it's a bicycle path, but there's also some like off-roading where you can walk off and hike kind of through some woods. Um, lots of deer there. Um, so that's Miriam Burns. So that, those are our scouts. Um, Cub Scout, our pack hikes once a month and we try to use um, local places, but we also try to make sure we get them in other areas too. So, you know, they can find, be in all different environments from the Indiana Dunes, hiking on the, the sand to learning um, out at Sand Ridge, learning about the settlers while they're hiking. So a lot of different things. I thought I had another picture that was going to pop up here. I oh, <laughs> so I'm sorry. I was going to try. Oh, that's to all right. Picture. That's all right. So, right. So the, a lot of different places, um, Big Marsh, Hegwish Marsh, again, um, trying the, to get them to Eggers see Woods. Eggers Woods, Wolf Lake. We um, met during Wolf COVID. Marsh. We spent two summers. Every summer we were out there at Wolf Lake doing all of our meetings, doing our fishing and hiking and doing environmental work and cleaning up. We did a couple of hikes where we just cleaned up trash um, as a way to give back. Um, and really found that the, the scouts just enjoy it so much to be outside and to be, you know, that they were able to have some normalcy during COVID, um, to be with their friends and to, you know, learn about, you know, everything scouting, but in, in, in the outdoors. Yeah. 
I think it's so important for kids to spend that time. One of the things I found when we were doing the walks is so many of the kids were finding stuff. Um, so here we found uh, the snail that was hanging out on uh, Queen Anne's lace that was dried up. Um, this horrible looking thing is called a dog's penis fungus. I know it's literally its name. It's called the dog's penis fungus. And um, it was, you know, I guess you would say it's fruiting at that time of year. It was producing, um, this was in the springtime and we found these in one of our walks. Um, there are actually quite a lot of them. And that would be the fruiting body and it would be producing the spores that would spread that. And notice that it's got this distinctive coloration. Um, these are stink uh, milkweed bugs and um, they have this warning coloration because they live on and off of the milkweed. So they eat Eat the that milkweed sap um, and the kids were fascinated they when they saw those and these are found only on milkweed plants and these are this is our native asclepius here but um, you can also see some ants uh, taking advantage of this little plant kids were when they stopped to look kids find so much stuff um, now we did see monarchs as well on the milkweed but you know you don't often think of some of the other animals that you see so the kids were seeing all sorts of stuff um, and we're very surprised like a lot of kids didn't have a lot of experience with that right they didn't have as much experience with nature as maybe they might have Another thing that we find a lot is that um, nature, spending time in nature really takes down stress levels. Um, I'm sure Lisa, you see that um, if Wayne's here, I'm sure Wayne can speak to that as well. But um, children who have places that they can retreat to, green spaces, really become more resilient. They become less stressed. And we say that they have, um, it gives them sort of, um, oh gosh darn it, I'm thinking, I can't think of the word now, but it's, it's, it has to do with this ideal of resiliency, um, that they have this ability to bounce back. They have um, more equanimity. They don't get as upset as easily in classrooms um, and also at home environments. So studies have found that um, if, if teachers have classes outdoors, even if it's just one day a week, um, this literally changes the cortisol patterns, the stress patterns in the bloodstreams of kids. Um, so it shows that they're showing less stress and they're becoming better adapted to stress when compared to students who have indoor only instruction. Um, this is another picture from uh, Lisa with her little Cub Scouts. You know, you can see a family outdoors and enjoying things. Um, right. So, so this is the Kano family. Oh, if you want to go back, this is the Kano family. So, the, and, the, and this is what I think is one of the, our pack has a lot of great things about it. And one of our one piece is that it's a family pack. And so when, you know, we don't ever just take a scout, a group of five scouts and with a leader, we take a group of five scouts and all of their families. So this is a mother with her grandmother and the little girl on the tricycle. So we include mm -hmm. siblings, we conclude grandparents and um, everybody gets outside and, and is a part of the pack and supporting their scouts, but also the scout, you know, knows that, you know, they're all out there together. So it's a great way to spend time, not only in scouting, but with their families as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and anyone who's done scouting uh, can testify like the family camp is a really awesome thing to do as well. Oh, right, most definitely. Yeah. So this is a group of my kids spending time together. Um, you know, they, they really, my kids loved this field trip that they did. And of course then COVID came through and we weren't able to do like, we were able to do the other field trips we'd planned for that year. Um, but we're planning, we were actually doing some field trips coming up. We're gonna be doing some. Um, so again, uh, this was taken, These both these pictures were taken at Marion Burns. I actually think I had that picture already shown, so sorry about that. Um, so you can see, you know, again, your family groups that are out here. Uh, Marion Burns is a park that just opened up officially, I think, last fall. Um, maybe it was last spring, but it hasn't been open really long. And um, I actually haven't been down here because I, I ride my bike past there sometimes and I haven't really, like usually I'm commuting and I'm not really paying attention to it, but I really wanna get down there because it really looks like, like an amazing area. Um, and I know that uh, they were, Joelle was talking about it last week or last month when we were talking about some of the things going on there. This is part of his uh, purview too. So we know that being in nature helps kids actually develop better self-discipline um, so that kids that spend time in nature are more engaged in learning, not only during those outdoor classes, but also upon coming back to other classrooms. So if they spend time in nature and they come back into the normal classroom, they actually do better in their other classes, even if the subject's not nature related. So they'll do better in their English class or better in their math class. Um, it, again, I think it ties in with bringing the stress levels down, um, helping kids to be more focused. I'm sure getting out and getting exercise and fresh air doesn't hurt that process. 
Um, so again, here's some examples, I think, of kids, you know, who are, are being pretty self-focused and diligent. You can see the kids walking down the little, um, the little woodcuts. Uh, I think that's over at Big Marsh. Am I wrong? Right. Right? The picture on the left is um, out at Wolf Lake. Those scouts were participating in a summer of service project. So they, we walked from the, the, the south end of Wolf Lake all the way to the north end of Wolf Lake, picking up trash along the way. Um, and then the other picture is out at Big Marsh. They have a nature play area that the scouts definitely um, took advantage of. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. And this is obviously we're doing your cleanup as well. Um, it looks like Wolf Lake on the left and I'm not right. sure that's Wolf Lake. Oh, Lake. right. So, right. So it's Wolf Lake on the left. The other place that is out at Eggers Woods. We did okay. a winter hike um, and a polar bear hike. And so, I mean, even in winter, the scouts found trash. And so um, they helped clean up even that day. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. My kids do that too. I give them extra credit for it though. Your kids are doing it from a little more intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. All right, so um, outdoor instruction does make students more engaged and more interested. So we know that many children, particularly those with ADHD, have trouble with impulse control and that can definitely get in the way of learning. So having a green space near these kids' homes can really help them develop more self-discipline and concentrate better. Interestingly, especially with girls, um, and even though boys typically have a more active form of ADHD or AD, um, you know, ADD, for girls, oftentimes they have what they call an inattentive, inattentive form. And this can really help kids with, you know, girls especially can help them with focusing, is spending time in nature, spending time in green spaces. Um, and also parents who have kids with this disability oftentimes find that their kids, when they participate in indoors activities, uh, it, they get a benefit, but when they do outdoor activities, they really get a benefit. They really see a benefit to their kids' behavior and how they focus. Um, again, these are some things that my kids pointed out to me. Um, this was this lurid fungus that we found out in the woods. I think this was in Eggers Woods that we came across. I think that's some kind of, um, I think they call them hen feathers or uh, ruffled hen uh, mushroom fungus. This was a woolly bear that we found out at Big Marsh. And uh, this was in a log. Someone flipped a log over and was like, whoa, what's this? Has someone been carving here? And I'm like, well, not exactly. Um, that's, you know, obviously insects, insect burrows where the insects have been, you know, gnawing through the wood as they start to decompose it. Um, I don't really know what particular insect that was. We all have has seen, kids have pointed out to me like um, leaf miners, which do the same sort of thing, but inside of a leaf where you'll have, uh, an egg that's laid on a leaf and then when it hatches out it burrows into the intermembrane of the leaf and will will uh you know eat through the membranes of the leaves and the kids are fascinated by that stuff i mean i think anyone who has curiosity um will have things with that uh there was a coyote that we spotted um so i think this was over down powderhorn prairie uh, this little toad, American toad, was found um, at Big Marsh. And again, just a little shot of Big Marsh showing some of the birds and the, the cattails and things. Um, so this, I, I recognize the location. I know this is Big Marsh. So Lisa, this is your little Cub Scouts again. Sorry, uh, I, sorry, I was up. Um, yes, again, that's Big Marsh. Um, and again, you're going to see um, the, the little Jack in the front there. That's one of our sibling scouts who has come along and participated. Um, but yes, along the one of the trails, they have a section that they have built there at Big Marsh to allow for groups to come and have um, campfires or a meeting place uh, within the woods. So this is out at Big Marsh. Mm -hmm. All right, so we know that uh, there's a lot of, I mean, this is like a no brainer, right? Being outdoors, you have typically have better physical fitness. Um, we know that cardiorespiratory fitness goes hand in hand with better cognitive development and processing. So kids who have higher fitness better levels tend to do better academically. Um, we don't know for sure. There's not data that I could find that there's a clear correlation between um, nature and physical fitness directly, but I think it's kind of intuitive that um, kids who spend more time in nature are going to have probably better cardiovascular fitness because they're being more active, they're getting out and they're doing things. Um, so there's some, there is a little evidence that says having access to nature can encourage kids to be more physically active and to keep in shape longer as they age because they've taken upon themselves to spend time in nature, to go out for a walk, to go out for a bike ride, um, you know, instead of just kind of sitting around in front of video games. 
All right, so this is uh, pictures taken from my bike club. We're out for a ride. This was actually in, um, uh, oh gosh darn it, uh, over by the steel mills that are over just off of um, 131st. Um, Major Taylor Trail comes down through there and I can't believe I'm just spazzing. My brain is going to mush, but um, that's a, a forest preserve that we oftentimes see a lot of deer and stuff down there. Um, and that's something that my bike club adopted these woods and we've now been working here for about 15 years doing cleanups. Um, and now are actually doing um, stewardship in there as well, doing a lot of weeding, taking down a lot of scrub. And the kids have kind of grown up doing that job as service. Um, I think this was taken at the dunes, I'm assuming, yes. right? Lisa? Yeah, so this one's out at West, um, West Beach and those are um, ice shelves in the background there. Um, so again, we took the opportunity to be in a different, hiking in a different environment, but also in using everything we come across as a learning experience. So we did a whole kind of lesson on, on ice shelves while we were out there, um, you know, how dangerous they are and to stay off of them. And um, so, right. And again, the, they, these scouts hiked for about three miles out at West Beach and, you know, while in one area they were seeing snow and the ice, in another area they were finding cactus. Um, yeah, so, pears, yeah. right, prickly pear cactus. So it was very neat for them to see, you know, all the different um, environments or habitats there in the area. Yeah, that is so cool. Uh, let's see if I can go to the next one. Okay. Um, so uh, this was another picture from Lisa with Cub Scouts. It looks like Marion Burns. But yep, another Marion Burns. Yes. All right. So nature settings seem to promote social connection and creativity. Um, we know that, um, that children can learn in lots of different environments, but letting kids spend time in nature really gives them these structured nature experiences that lead for a calmer, more socially safe and fun learning environment. We also have found evidence that um, the kids who are spent a lot of time outdoors have better peer-to-peer -peer relationships, and even their student-teacher relationships can become um, more positive and stronger. All right, so these are some pictures showing kids spending some time with um, some social interactions. These were all pictures of my students. These were all taken at Big Marsh. And you can kind of see this is the same area that, uh, that Lisa took her picture with her kids, you know, this little sort of mound of dirt where kids like to hang out. My kids had so much fun when they were over at Big Marsh. Um, so, and again, uh, this was taken at Wolf Lake. This was taken over um, in Calumet Park. And this looks like it's Marion Burns. I might be wrong on that, Lisa, but you can yes. correct me. Yes, um, that's the definitely, again, definitely a Marion Burns during COVID. So that was how we were so careful. That's how we took our pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it with the, the, the <laughs> distance thing. It's so cute. Um, the kids were doing some observations. My kids were doing a lot of observations about the lakefront. Of course, the water level is super high right now when this was taken. This was taken two years ago. Um, and if you know, like this beach actually now, it's a, it's a little bit better. But this all where my, where my mouse is going, this all used to be beach. Um, that also be sand. And now it's all underwater because of the rising of the lake level. Um, but uh, you know, spending time in nature is really beneficial. I love the fact that you take your kids out in the wintertime too, because I think- Yes, we, we, well. don't, we don't miss a month. We hike, every, you know, every month we make an attempt, you know, if it is extremely cold or something then we may have to cancel, but um, this is out at Eggers Woods. Um, and again, what is important, I think, too, to note in this picture is that um, it's very um, different ages. So, you know, the younger scout is learning from the older scouts on how to be prepared. They all come out prepared. They are all dressed appropriately. They have their backpacks and they have water and they have the essentials for hiking. So they've, they're learning the things, you know, the basic things now that they will carry with them when they are, you know, much older and hiking still with maybe with their own kids. Yeah, totally. Okay, so nature promotes curiosity and wonder. Um, this was taken out by Eggers Woods. They actually have a problem with the deer, but they're quite bold there. But the kids just love seeing the deer, as you can imagine. 
Um, and this was a little snail that uh, was a different one from the one that we saw earlier, but uh, this little guy, we took him into our classroom and studied him for about a week. And then I brought him back out to the forest preserve and let him go. Um, Cause you're not supposed to take things from the forest preserve, but we did, uh, the kids really enjoyed learning about him and watching him. He was quite a very active little snail. Um, and I can't remember which variety he was, but he's, you know, it's not like he's rare or anything. He's not, he's not special that way, but it was kind of cool. The kids certainly had a lot of fun with him. All right, so um, one of the things I find is that um, this was out at Eggers Woods where you still have some of the dune and swale ecology. Um, and this is, of course, talked about the Ice Age. Unfortunately, a lot of these signs have really taken damage um, between graffiti and just wear and tear. Um, but it's still really interesting. And I think the kids here, they were, they were surprised because it was like, they were like, why is it wet? Why is it dry? You know, like the, and that of course is part and parcel of that dune and swale ecology, which you can teach about, you know, kids can learn about. It's really interesting for them. Um, some of the nature that we saw, you can see the monarch butterfly down here on the New England asters. This is one of my students who was just fascinated by like all the little, the mosses and the things she was seeing. We saw, of course, a lot of little fish. This was at Wolf Lake. And this is also was a Wolf Lake where we saw the, the, um, the heron. Um, so, uh, and of course, I am sorry, this is grainy. This is kind of enlarged and supersized and, you know, the kid, we weren't that close to it, but still the kids, you know, they get so excited when they see this stuff because they don't really have much of an opportunity to spend that time in nature. So what about the how? So how do we get kids into nature, right? Um, there's lots of ways we can do it. For a classroom teacher, obviously a field trip is a really good way to do that. Um, but even just holding an outdoor class, right? Taking your kids out and, sitting on the front lawn or taking them into your back field if you have one um, and teaching class outdoors whether or not you know if it's a poetry class or if it's a you know it doesn't always have to be science right um having a community or a school garden i found it really interesting that the data was saying that even kids who could look out into a green space saw benefits saw benefits in being more calm more focused and more able to stay on task um, so I thought, you know, my school has been talking about doing community garden for like a food reason, um, just to provide, you know, like uh, opportunities for people to have fresh food in the summertime. Um, but, you know, like we, you can do more with school gardens as an opportunity to bring in green spaces. Obviously nature walks around school, just taking a walk maybe to a local park or trail. Nature journaling can be a very powerful thing for kids, um, making observations. Um, I use lab notebooks and I have encouraged kids to do drawings and to make observations into those. Even in physics class, I encourage them to like, we, we went outside, we were outside twice this week because we were launching rockets um, and they were just stomp rockets. They're air powered rockets. One was uh, like just a foot stomp. Another one was a hand stomp, like a hand uh, powered um, rocket. And then we also had one that was powered with a bicycle pump. That one was pretty impressive. That went up about 110. 10, 120 feet, we estimate. Um, but, you know, like having kids be out in that green space, like I know the kids had a better day. Kids were telling me, oh, we got to do that again, Miss Healy, you know, and sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, you know, obviously you can't do it every day, but um, I have found great luck with spending time with kids building and then maintaining terrariums. Um, I use it as a capstone activity that I kind of come back to all year round where kids are studying change, they're studying cause and effect, they're studying um, ecosystems, they're studying plant speciation, life cycles of things. Um, there's lots of learning that can go on there. And then you can also build in lab skills such as, you know, measurements and taking data. Um, yeah. How do you do graphing? You know, like, what are you talking about? Like uh, doing species surveys, we can do all of that when we do terrariums. Um, another thing is they can collect, they can collect leaves, they can collect feathers, um, they can collect photos, they can take images on their phones, they can do a digital collection, they can collect sounds. Um, we have amazing technology nowadays, you can take your phone and you can do a little voice recording on every phone it has a little voice recorder feature. Kids can do sounds about nature or they can do verbal journaling. Um, these are great ways to get kids into nature and focusing on stuff. And then you can, of course, do extracurricular activities, things like the after school matters programs that are done in the park districts, obviously scouting, um, school clubs. I have an ecology club, an environmental club that goes out and does stuff. Um, bird watching is a great thing. The, the Audubon Society is running um, bird watching things in Bussy Woods and over in, um, uh, what's the one that's over by Alcal Gardens, the big forest preserve back there. They're offering free ones on Wednesdays. Um, Bobian, it's Bobian Woods. That's it, Bobian Woods, thank you. 
Um, and then you can obviously have programming through the parks and the forest preserves. Um, our city of Chicago parks do a lot of really cool outdoor programming and well as the forest preserves of Cook County and Will County offer some really great um, classes that are free or very minimal cost. Um, so those are certainly things to investigate. Um, and I, I think like, I thought this was such a cute picture of the kids like having fun with their little, their little snowman with made with like little pine cones and little stalks of grass and stuff. I thought that was adorable. Um, that was Lisa's kids, her, her little. Uh, yep, those, those, those are our scouts. That was the end of the hike. There was just yeah. a little bit of snow left for us to build yeah. the, the snowman and leave something behind. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It was so cute. All right, so um, I thought maybe we could come up with maybe some brainstorming, so maybe ideas that you might have that you could help kids connect with nature. And then what things do you think will help kids, um, what will you do to help kids find resources? So how can you reach out? How can you share out the information that you have? So, um, you know, two, two pieces of this, like, you know, what do you think you could do to help kids connect with nature? And then what things do you think would be helpful for kids to find resources? Um, so I don't know if, if we, we have enough time, like we could do a little breakout group for a couple of, of minutes. I don't know if there's interest in that, but I would love hearing people's ideas if they have things that they could share out. I think, I think breakout rooms might be difficult. I hate to spend too much time trying to figure it out, but, no. if, okay. but if people can just comment now, you know, unmute themselves or type it in the chat, um, you know, I, for our pack for Cub Scouts, we really try hard to um, form relationships with lots of different people in the community. So working at um, spending time at a community garden, helping at a, build a um, po pollinator garden, or then we went to Big Marsh to learn about um, butterflies. We went to Jane Healy's class to do some science. So I find that, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I really try to find other people so that scouts can see um, everybody in their community who has a part in this, not just me up there talking about things and, and giving them information, they're hearing it from all different places in all different parts of their community. Um, so for me, that's really important. And one of the other things for our scouts we really try to do is to make sure that they understand the um, jobs that are available. So um, from, for presentations in the environment. So maybe we are out at, um, Big Marsh, but then whoever is presenting talks about what they did, you know, how did they get their job? What did they have to do to get their job? Did they go to school? Or, you know, we might come across by somebody who is doing environmental work out there. I know one of our hikes, they were people doing um, um, invasive, uh, killing invasive things. And so they got to talk to those people and learn about how those people got their jobs because I want them to think, you know, ahead you know, definitely think ahead and how, what, you know, for their futures too, as well. Mm -hmm. For sure. Other ideas? Can I say something? Uh, can, I, can I say something? Uh, I'm talking from uh, the Boy Scouts, because Lisa deals with Cub Scouts, the younger boys. What I was thinking with the Boy Scouts, uh, I'm just going to throw two ideas out there. Uh, uh, not for this year, because it takes like a year of planning, but the uh, Boy Scouts, the older boys and, and girls, uh, they have what they call Camp Arees. I don't know if uh, Big Marsh or whatever we uh, capable of that, but I mean, you're talking about like maybe, or maybe even for one day, but uh, Camp Arees, uh, usually for a weekend, you get between five and 8,000 uh, uh, kids and they go to stations learning about crafts and nature and stuff like that and uh, events. But if you needed help with uh, something, I was just thinking uh, for, from an environmentalist point of view, uh, maybe a one day thing where, uh, you know, 3,000, 4,000 scouts are running around, well, well, not running around, but just walking around in their troops. So they're in groups of 20 or 30 or 10. Uh, uh, service projects, helping to clean up, helping, you need something, uh, removed or you need something moved or do they have to, uh, you know, or some, something that will help them learn about doing service projects for the community. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, again, like a lot of campery is a big uh, endeavor. I don't know if you have the facilities for that, uh, wash, washrooms, whatever, but I'm just, from a scouting point of view, that's what I'm looking at. Uh, I don't know what you would do with uh, 
high schools or grammar schools, but maybe something similar where they do. Like, yeah, 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 where they're doing service project. Well, we kind of do uh, the cleanups in the forest reserve too, but uh, I, I would like to see us adopt, like my school kids, we're really, I really want them to adopt a particular place and then to develop a relationship with that place so they can see how it benefits over time. Um, and they could take pride in sort of making a difference that they can visibly see. Um, but, you know, again, I mean, I think that ties in really nicely with what you're saying, Mr. Morales, I think absolutely. I've done camperies with my, my son who was in scouting um, and they're amazing. They're so, they're so cool. Um, and it's, it's really neat to see these huge groups of scouts that they can, I mean, it's amazing what they can do. I mean, amazing what they can do. So even if it's a day thing, sometimes I've seen like the, I don't even know if they, the major camperies, but they're just, it's a really neat, really neat thing for kids. Yeah. M Miguel, uh, Wayne Shim, sorry I was late. Uh, my wife and I were out on errands and everything. We lost track of time. But Miguel, uh, that uh, and the scouts, uh, yeah, talking, I didn't, sorry uh, that I didn't get a chance to put anything together electronically because I have no idea how to uh, put a presentation or import pictures or anything like that. So I'll just quickly go through a, th a few things that the uh, Boy Scouts, Miguel, have the Distinguished Conservation Service Award, uh, and then also the World Conservation Award in that. And if, uh, if you'd like to get more involved with conservation, uh, you know, contact me and I can get you involved with our conservation committee. Uh, the one thing that I want to uh, stress that uh, scouts offer that they can become the experiential arm or field trip arm because all the students go to some school. And so right now I'm beginning to work with the Chicago Public Schools uh, and uh, also with the Arnold Randall, the General Superintendent of the Forest Preserve District of Cook County in order to do some cross pollinating uh, where the scouts do the outing part in the community that's tied in with the particular curriculum of the sixth grader uh, who's in the uh, 12 year old in the troop and so on like that. So that's uh, one thing. And then also for the teachers uh, that would want to share uh, more like uh, Jane and, uh, has done and so on like that, there's a newly formed group here called the Chicago Environmental Educators. And they're gonna be meeting tomorrow night online, a uh, Zoom meeting uh, in that. And then also there's a statewide association called the Environmental Education Association of Illinois. Uh, we're having our 50th uh, uh, co uh, annual convention this weekend. I was at the first one and help to form that. So that's a resource that's out there for educators. Um, the, let's see, what else have I got in my notes? Oh, and Jane, you were talking about what research, uh, you know, shows and, and so on like that. And there is a national, um, national uh, association, National Association for Environmental Education that has all kinds of research data and so on uh, to back up uh, the educational use if you're trying to apply for a grant or making another PowerPoint presentation and so on, you can go in and get documented uh, uh, you know, resources and so on on that. And then the thing that uh, Jane has uh, joined in is going globally with the high school students sharing uh, through the group called Caretakers of the Environment International. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are some other uh, networking uh, resources that are out there that you can uh, use and so on. And again, uh, okay. Miguel and Lisa, you two are uh, certainly leadership spark plugs uh, in scouting and you're part of the council in that. And I'd really like to, you know, work with uh, you folks in growing up more into other schools and so on down there. And regarding a camporee, the council is going to have uh, another fall camporee in October uh, up at uh, McHenry County Fairgrounds. 
and there will be a conservation world up there. So again, I'll stop talking that, uh, but again, those are the resources and that uh, that are you know available. All right, I, Wayne, I think that's so important too to to say that again that the about partnerships, you know, I, I, and to look for where those partnerships can exist, you know. Um, Cub Scout Pack 773 found a partnership with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District and was able to get um, uh, seeds to grow milkweed. And so we did that last last year and grew the milkweed, planted it out at a community to, you know, started a pollinator garden at the um, the garden behind a senior building here in the neighborhood. Um, and this year we're gonna, we got more seeds this year and are again gonna do that same thing. So I think partnerships are so important um, and to yeah. teach our young people how important partnerships are that we all have got to work together. We all bring something to the table and we can you know, make that all happen. And, and even kids can make things happen. I think that's, you know again, what I try to um, let our scouts know that even though they are you know, a lion, a five years old, they can grow seeds and you know grow milkweed and um, have an impact on their environment. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we're talking about <laughs> partnerships. Uh, keep in mind that uh, you've got uh, opportunities to form if you're interested in Lake Michigan. There's the Alliance for the Great Lakes, which is a great not-for-profit, you know, partnership and. Uh, Lake Michigan shoreline cleanups and that. And moving inland, uh, you have got friends of the river, uh, Chicago rivers. And then you've got friends of the parks and you got friends of the forest preserves. So you got a whole lot of friends out there that want to uh, uh, you know, partner and they all have service activities and so on like that. And they all can help uh, line up and arrange for uh, service days and so on. And Jane, one thing you mentioned about gardens, uh, school gardens, uh, the thing that I'm trying to promote now because see vegetable gardens, fruit and vegetable gardens, you need a lot of input during the summertime and a lot of schools, uh, their gardens that uh, they get planted while the schools are there, but nobody's there over the summertime. So I'm encouraging people uh, to get involved with uh, of uh, doing gardens where they plant locally rare and endangered species in that in order to help the native biodiversity and then turn the uh, different uh, gardens into propagation ones and so on. So after a year or two, they can divide the plants. The students can take them home and put them in their gardens or you can plant them on the grounds of a local public library or go to a firehouse and plant it around there and so on. So uh, just some other ideas. Yeah, I love it. Do, do any of the other people have uh, on the call have questions that you want to uh, ask us or um, you know challenge us or add to it or uh, our presentation? So again, Jane, thank you for putting this together. I know you're highly overworked and underpaid, but thank you for doing this and, and that, so. My pleasure. Okay, uh, do we have uh, other questions then? Well, if not, I just wanna remind everyone that uh, next month's speaker will be Madeline Tudor of the Field Museum, who will uh, bring us up to date on efforts to establish a national heritage area in the Calumet region. Uh, this will be uh, the year's final session. Um, we'll see you on May 3rd. And uh, the forum's uh, ninth season begins in September then. So I just want to thank everybody for coming uh, this evening. And, um, and especially, uh, Jane, the presentation was great. And um, thank you uh, for doing that. And uh, nice to see you, uh, Wayne and Lisa, and um, we'll be talking later, okay? All right, bye everybody, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, thank, thank you, you again, Shane. Yeah, bye-bye, yeah. thank you.